This is Amari Purple Talk. Yes. Welcome to episode 60 of Amari Purple Talk, a podcast where I share my thoughts on the Prince musical singularity. I'm Richard Cole, your imagination funk soloist. Thank you once again for tuning in. Please leave your comments in the comments section below and please download on your favorite podcast platform. If you're listening on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And before we dive into our main topics, I want to talk about episode 59 for a minute and cover a few announcements. So starting with episode 59, uh, there was some trouble with the Liberated Syndication Network uh, putting that up on YouTube. Uh, Liberated Syndication or Libsyn uh, is the platform that I use uh, to bring this show to your various podcast platforms as well as YouTube. So they were having some difficulty last week. So episode 59 did not make it. For YouTube listeners, for now, you can still catch episode 59 on wherever you listen on your podcast platform, whether it's Spotify, Deezer, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts. Be sure to check it out there. Uh, But I will do an upload for episode 59 myself onto YouTube uh, sometime this week, hopefully. So look out for that soon. And now we're going to move on to some announcements. And we're going to start with the Prince Twitter thread. Right now we are on Sign of the Times. Uh, We had a brilliant three-part introduction by DJ UMB. And by all means, check that out for sure. Uh, This is a Twitter thread on the Super Deluxe Edition. Uh, Right now, we're starting with the original album remaster. So, again, with the three-part introduction that led it all off, Sunday, we had Casey Rain introduce the title track or do his thesis on the title track. Very deep and insightful Twitter read, so I recommend you check it out. So uh, this will be going all the way until November 2nd, and my segment will be a door, so I'll be doing the absolute last song for the original album, Uh, not doing it as far as singing it, because that would be bad, but you will have my thoughts and insights about one of my favorite tracks on that album. So definitely check it out, what's out so far. By the time most of you will hear this episode today, uh, there will be a Twitter thread on Play in the Sunshine by Rhonda Nicole. October 13th, we'll have a thread by Scott Woods, who'll be doing Housequake. And like I said, this is uh, all the scholars, all the Prince podcasters, or Purple Scholars. We've been dubbed the Purple Avengers, and we're going to be bringing it to the Prince Twitter universe, the PTU. So jump onto Twitter. Uh, you can do the hashtag Prince Twitter thread or S O T T Super Deluxe, which is Sign of the Times Super Deluxe. So with those two hashtags, check it out, see what's going on, and a good time will be guaranteed for all. No, that's a Beatles reference, but anyway, this is off the top of the dome. And we're going to actually just go ahead and move on to our first topic, or our main topic. And this is going to be a spoiler review of Neil Carlin's book, This Thing Called Life, Prince's Odyssey on and off the record. All right, so this book dropped last Tuesday, which uh, was October 6th. Um, 
Now, this I got on time, actually. Uh, of course, you know, sign of the time, super deluxe. A lot of people uh, were delayed on getting that. I know mine was delayed, but it still arrived earlier than what they told me the delay was. So that was great. But this book arrived on time. And I think initially when I heard this book was coming out, I was really excited about it. I've enjoyed Neil Carlin's interviews with Prince, uh, the one from 1985 and the one from 1990. I was unaware that he did the one uh, where he mostly interviewed Lisa and Wendy. And it's that cover of Rolling Stone uh, with Prince, you know, his parade era, uh, Prince with Wendy and Lisa on the cover. I was unaware that he did that interview. Uh, so I'm going to have to go dig that one back up and re, you know, reread that one. So I was really excited for this book. So I am actually about almost three quarters of the way finished. Uh, hence that this is going to be a non-spoiler review. Um, I'll do a spoiler review. Probably this will take place the next episode or I may do a YouTube special. Not quite sure. But uh, ended up checking this out. I'm three quarters of the way through this one. I also just started Brown Mark's book as well. So um, I'll be doing spoiler reviews for both of those. Uh, like I said, if it doesn't take place next episode, there'll probably be special YouTube videos for those. But for right now, this is a non-spoiler. So basically my overall thoughts, like I said, I'm three quarters of the way through. So I don't have an overall opinion. So I'm going to start basically with this. I've got a lot of books on my shelf covering a variety of subjects. You know, from the historical to the political to, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, like esoteric, I guess, um, music, history, things of that nature. And, you know, I just like to read a lot. So there are books, even with the most complicated of subjects, like I can, you know, I have a book on my shelf that's pretty much quantum physics that I can read cover to cover. And it flows smoothly. And then there's some books that, you know, it's kind of like a reference book. You know, you don't read it cover to cover. You just kind of find things to reference with. And then there's some things that are a bit of a struggle. And it may not necessarily be because of, you know, it doesn't make it less interesting. But sometimes they kind of read like a textbook. This kind of falls for me in the category of a struggle. And again, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a struggle for a variety of reasons. And, you know, I, if you follow me on, so, well, maybe not necessarily follow me on social media, but I've made comments on other people that have brought up the subject of this book. Um, and just basically just a quick one or two sentence evaluation of what I was getting out of it thus far. And at that particular point, I don't think I quite made it halfway through the book yet. But definitely the first part of this book is a bit of a struggle. And the one and this necessarily isn't a spoiler because this excerpt appeared in Rolling Stone. And basically that excerpt is actually the beginning of the book because I did read that excerpt in Rolling Stone uh, shortly before, you know, I received the book myself. So, yeah, it's a it's a heavy read because it's it's basically Neil Carlin discussing basically the last conversation or conversations he had with Prince, you know, prior to August 20 or excuse me, April 21st. 2016 and you know that's heavy I remember uh, with Alex Hahn's book which is a really really good book to read um, and that was one I you know went through cover to cover but that beginning that introduction it's heavy because it covers the end 
And I guess, you know, the thing is, is that what I've seen on social media, you know, there's people that receive the book and they're knee deep in reading it. There are people kind of wondering, should they get it? And then, of course, you're going to have the naysayers that are like, you know, don't buy this book, you know, for the reasons why, you know, nine times out of 10, most of these people are kind of like, you know, they trash any book about Prince, you know, because it's, you know, it's taking him off the pedestal. And for me, like I said, it started off with such a heavy tone. And it does kind of go on the first half of it to where, yeah, you're going through, you know, he's going through the anecdotes or certain anecdotes um, at the same time, kind of going over his origins on his reasons why he's writing the book and things of that nature. And it, it brings up a couple of things that just it constantly reminds you of the end but there's a there's a reason for that and for me the book really sort of takes off closer to halfway through and it, to me it's starting to really amp up as I'm getting you know closer to the finish line on this book I guess to a lot it won't be uh, obvious you know the point won't be so clearly obvious you know, because you'll pick out basically what you'll pick out out of it, meaning that, you know, you'll probably go, oh, this book is, tr you know, it's a it's a trash piece. You know, it's it's going to be divisive on a lot of levels. And again, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But what you know, it's going to be subjective. You know, there will be people that will like this book and understand what's going on with it. And then there will be people that won't get it and won't like it. And, you know, it's just like with anything. Like I say, we have Prince albums that we love. There are Prince albums that we love a little less. And that's okay. You know, what my favorites are, you might not like. What you like, I might not like. But that's okay. It's about what you get out of it. And I guess I'll kind of just give some brief things that I like about the book. Um, like I said, it does take a deeper dive at the moments of, you know, the, the 1985 Rolling Stone interview. Um, it takes a deeper dive into the 1990 Rolling Stone interview. It also takes the one with Wendy and Lisa into context as well. And the, the thing we have to understand about this book as well, it's not just, you know, where, the, you know, he's making this stuff up. This is not an Albert Goldman book by any means, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. Because these are based on notes that were taken during interviews. They're based on actual recorded conversations. And, you know, I had to remind myself of that when it gets to certain points or certain opinions of his you know, of Neil Carlin's that it's like, you know, that's a pretty heavy observation, you know, or there are quotes of Prince and these are things that are definitely off the record. You know, these are things that didn't make the official interview or like I said, you know, certain things, it's a deeper dive of that conversation of the moment. And a lot of things too are based on conversations over the years in between those landmark interviews and some incidents or things even after. And I like that it does peel back some layers. Now, you know, again, we have to remember that, you know, Prince is one of those like, say, Michael Jackson, you know, like the Beatles or you know, there's certain echelons of entertainers that are so larger than life. Like I said, that preservation of myth, that keeping them on the pedestal. You know, there, there's places that these people have, you know, no one else 
has been there before. No one has been famous to that magnitude that, you know, we come away with the myth of nothing ever goes wrong, you know, or they can't have flaws. They can't have imperfections. They can't have bad days. You know, there's superheroes in our own minds or, you know, and especially with, say, movie stars, recording artists, you know, we get so caught up in the body of work, you know, as it is happening within the context of our own lives. So, you know, we get attached to certain records or certain songs, certain albums, certain films, just based on where we are at that moment. You know, were we, were we happy in that period? Were we sad in that period? You know, or, or you know, we playing the record backwards or we're dissecting the lyrics and, you know, turning them sideways to get an inkling of who these people really are. And I think what where it's going to really put off a few people is that you're going to get a sort of analysis of an, a human being that just happened to be one of those human beings that has had a level of fame, celebrity, talent that no one else has been able to go. Um, I mean, granted, you know, the, the Beatles were one of the first to kind of go where no one has gone before, but they're more of an open book, you know especially John Lennon, you know, what you saw was what you got, you know, his thinking, you know, you got to see his thinking change and he pronounced it, you know, whether it was in interview and in song, he always managed to tell the truth where, you know, you have your Michael Jackson's, you have your Prince that were a little bit more guarded than that. In other words, it was built on a level of mystique and for me, like I said, I've always been into the body of work. So the myth doesn't really bother me. The, you know, the, you know, the mystique doesn't really bother me. It was cool when I was 17 in 1983, reading that one Rolling Stone article. Like I said, that's the thing that framed 1999, you know, going into Purple Rain. That's what solidified, you know, Prince music for me at 17 as opposed to you know the jumping on point with dirty mind and even controversy you know for me it was far to the left of what everybody else was doing but you know there was enough of the mystique to draw you into the records but yeah that whole rolling stone cover with him and vanity and that whole mystique you know solidified it for me and that has been forever etched you know even to this day you know I look back at that with a certain fondness but there's albums where he had matured from that all the way up until you know 2016 itself you know there was a little bit of being more accessible or being more honest you know um, the Miles Marshall Lewis interview uh, in Ebony, where it was a little too honest, you know, and had been withdrawn. Now, that's the book, too, I would want to read. You know, to me, that was sort of the Lennon Remembers or the the Lennon Playboy interview level that, you know, for decades, we all wish Prince would just do that one day and go there that day. And I want to see that book, you know, come out with that in its entirety. But, you know, back to Neil Carlin's book, like I said, there's going to be some surprises, you know, for a lot of people. You know, it's, it might be a little too real for some. Um, but to me, when it really starts to take off, and like I said, for me, it's the kind of towards the middle. Uh, there's three particular chapters to where it builds, it, you know, to actually what's you know to what i think that neil carlin's getting at you know i could be wrong it could be something totally different than what his intentions are 
And I think he does kind of spell them out pretty well throughout the book. Now, I think once it gets to the end, you know, he'll be able to wrap it all up and, you know, summarize what this journey was. I do think part of it, it's therapy. You know, it's it's a way of coping with the loss, you know, and I mean, he admits, you know, it wasn't like they were the best of friends, you know, but according to him, it's like, yeah, he let certain people in a certain way. You know, you only got a part of what the whole of Prince really is. And to me, I think that is one of the most valid points to make about this book and especially for a lot of people that want to hold on to a certain myth or hold on to a certain image. Now, if that's what's getting you through the day, that's fine. You know, that's fine to do that. But, you know, don't trounce other people if they have a different perspective. You know, if say the people in his life from 79 to 86 you know, have a certain perception versus the people from 2007 to, you know, 2010 or something. You know, that's their experience. You know, they were able to have an access that, you know, myself, you know, anybody else, whether they're podcast hosts, whether they're, you know, just deep cut fans, all of us wish we would have been granted that access at one point in our lives and we all probably would have been treated differently accordingly. You know, some would have gotten this far, some would have gotten less, you know, or some would have gotten more, you know, but it's painting a picture of a human being. And that's the thing that I'm interested in as I'm taking a deeper dive in this book. There's one particular chapter, actually I'm almost done with it. That is, an eye opener you know for me you know that was the one that was it there's a lot of things that solidifies it for me now in the introduction of the book like i said the excerpt that was put onto rolling stone that's a that's a spoiler so you can go read that if you don't have the book already but um i'll say one of the fascinating things for me <laughs> was learning how much of a TV buff that Prince was, you know, and the fact that he was a fan of Happy Days and is able to do a perfect imitation of one Arthur Fonzarelli. And the reason why I'm pointing this out, because I'm telling you, for years, I have a Love Sexy concert um, bootleg. It's on cassette. It's from... Washington, D.C. And I haven't had a chance to dig it out and play it yet. Um, Because I haven't played it in years. But during kind of where he's kind of doing the the sort of, I don't want to say preaching, but he's being a bit preachy. And I think it's during, yeah, Anastasia, I think. And he's being a bit preachy. You know, I mean, he could have gone obvious all full-on Baptist preacher but what just made me just kind of do a dog ear every time I listen to that it's like my god he sounds like the Fonz and I'm thinking like well okay it's Minnesota it's up north you know it's the or the Midwest you know it's kind of like you know maybe it's a dialect thing or an accent thing you know Maybe there's just that similarities that Henry Winkler as an actor was able to. But no, it but to me, it was like, no, he sounds like Fonzie. And then there is the, you know, Love for One Another tour, the Emancipation tour, um, whichever you want to call it. And, you know, as he's doing sort of the intro to Face Down, you know, where he goes my face is clean. I'm like, God, he sounds like Fonzie. You know, and it's like, now I get it. He's actually sounding like Fonzie for real. Whether it's conscious or unintentional or whether that's the source of inspiration for having confidence 
and stage presence, which I mean, you know, of course, by Love Sexy, that's been good and mastered, obviously, and definitely by Emancipation. But, you know, sometimes those basic inspirations, you know, sort of like Eddie Murphy, you know, every time he's in an action scene and he's holding a gun, his inspiration is Bruce Lee, you know, just the kind of way Bruce Lee looks in the films, that sort of look he has, you know, that's Eddie Murphy's kind of go-to, you know, for method. And maybe that's it, but that's just my personal observation. But yes, to me, on those two bootleg recordings, he sounds like Fonzie. <laughs> All right, but, you know, but like I said, at those sort of anecdotes and those sort of layers are enjoyable when it's enjoyable it's enjoyable there are some things like i said whether it's therapeutic or whether it's it's making a case that this person was human you know or it's it's going to be a counterpoint to a lot of the other books that are coming out and to say look you know as a journalist as somebody on a certain level that he considered a friend you know, based on my observations and based on what I have written down and committed to tape, this is what's real. And let's not get it lost, whether it's, you know, the media, whether it's the sort of annals of history where things tend to get sort of glossed over or whitewashed or, you know, here's a, a record to help provide some balance and to give another layer as well. So I personally recommend this book. Um, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I'm three quarters of the way through. So I'll probably have a better evaluation of it once I do the spoiler review, kind of once I start to put my notes together for the spoiler review. But I know kind of in the beginning, I'm like, ah, I, you know, I kind of get where he's going, but I'm just not sure. And then now, like I said, as I'm getting deeper, deeper into it, I'm getting a clue as to what the definitive statement is on it. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff. It will take you in a lot of different directions. Like I said, some stuff you'll enjoy, you'll laugh. There's some stuff that it's going to be hard to take. Like I said, if you know, if you're one of those that's like, hey, you know, Prince or whatever, whoever your favorite celebrity is, and they just do absolutely no wrong, then just, you know, read it and make up your own mind. You know, that's all I have to say for the sort of the negative, if there is any negative aspects. But I will say this based on what I'm getting to, there's a couple of things in there that really put the whole thing into perspective and I'll get deeper into those during the spoiler review but like I said it it made it put a lot of things in perspective for me and really helped me to understand or really confirm actually you know because there's a lot of things you suspect you know whether it was a happy time or it was a confusing time sort of, you know, as you got into the later, you know, the later 90s into the next century. And, you know, it's it, it's not a knock on the music or the creativity or, you know, it's just or why certain moves were made and how certain things turned out or. Yeah, it just confirmed it really confirmed a lot. And like I said, I'll get into it more during the spoiler review. But yeah, that was pretty. Yeah, those two things are definitely heavy items for me. And I can't wait to share those uh, next week. Um, I mean, as far as if I have any misgivings, I think it's just a matter of personal writing style, you know, um, like I said, I'm also reading the Brown Mark book. And then even though he had some assistance uh, in writing that book, there's a certain flow that's a, a little bit easier. It's more of a narrative um, in chronological order 
to where it just flows. You know, I don't have any, you know, that's one I'm not struggling with. This one, I think it's just a matter of just writing style to me is why I'm struggling because it's, you know, it's making a point and then it's, you know, I don't know. It just kind of, kind of like almost like a stop start type thing where it's like, it's, it's one of those like a TV show, they'll start, you know, they don't really do it in order, chronological order. It's like, here's this particular scene, and then it's, you know, six months earlier. You know, it cuts to that. And then now it cuts to, you know, two hours later, and then it cuts back to to that. That's sort of the one of the few things about it. Um, like I said, the earlier chapters where I really wasn't quite sure. And like I said, some people might get it right off the bat. Like, oh, I know exactly where he's going. But for me, because it took me halfway to kind of realize what was happening for it, you know, like I said, but those are small, tiny, just small criticisms uh, that I have about it. But yeah, it's one that I definitely recommend that you get. Um read it at your own risk and I would say that in a positive way like I said there's it will put some things in perspective but it's just based on your level of you know attachment like I said if you prefer the pedestal if you prefer the myth like I said proceed with caution but like I said I for a lot of others it will definitely open your eyes in some places There are some places like, man, did he really say that? (laughs) Well, that is off the record, but whew. (laughs) And then there's some, like I said, just some observations based on the anecdotes that you'll come away with a perspective that it's not going to, you know, you won't have a negative view of Prince. It'll just, I don't know, it will, like I said, without giving away any spoilers, how can I put it? you will have a level of understanding to where, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess there's an article. I haven't read it yet. Uh, Maybe it's the same excerpt. But, you know, the, it's sort of that loneliness, like, like Elvis, you know, it's that kind of tragic thing, or even like Michael Jackson to a certain degree, to where you're the only one that really knows what it feels like, you know, where it's like, yeah, he had the revolution, you know, yeah, he had the sign of the times love sexy band, yeah, he had, you know, whatever interchangeable friend, protege, bodyguard, whoever you could stick into the mix, you know, um, you know, two wives or two ex-wives, you know, but only he knew what it felt like, you know, like I said, he wasn't an open book like a, like a John Lennon or Paul McCartney that could have had like a Yoko or Linda by his side to balance him out, you know, um, you know, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty sad, it's pretty lonely and you'll get sort of a, an idea that kind of puts that into its perspective and like I said we'll we'll discuss it next week so um, again like I said definitely check this book out and let me know your comments let me know your thoughts about this book uh, is it something that you're on the fence about getting do you already have it did you finish reading it and if you did read it uh, do you like the book do you not like the book Leave me a comment and let me know your thoughts. And what I'm going to move on to next, uh, hopefully a lot of you checked this out yesterday. Uh, I've been announcing it here on Amari Purple Talk. And it was the celebration for the Sign of the Times Super Deluxe. Uh, It was curated by Polish Solid Productions. D'Angela Duff was the moderator. And I got a chance to check out most of it. I uh, had a couple of distractions uh, during one of the segments. Uh, so 
but I'm looking forward to checking it out. It's on YouTube. I put a link to the channel uh, in the show notes. So definitely, if you have not had a chance to check this out, by all means, check it out. Um, of course, my, one of my favorites was the Madhouse segment. Uh, the Sign of the Times, the live material segment uh, with Eric Leeds, Matt Fink as a guest. Uh, Matt Fink was the sole guest for the Madhouse Symposium. And let's see, I also have to rewatch the uh, symposium on the New Year's Eve show as well. Um, you know, because the the YouTube police got involved and you know it was pulling the plug you know it's kind of like one of those things where you know the the big conspiracy is about to be revealed and all of a sudden click beep you know <laughs> it was you know that was a bit awkward but by all means definitely check that out if you haven't seen it already or it's up there on YouTube um, to rewatch as well so like i said i'm looking forward to diving back into that as well so uh, definitely check it out it's on youtube and link is in the show notes i know you know this is like just a sign of the time season you know this is to me this is better than 1987 you know this is better than when i was going through it the first time you know god you know this was you know i still remember you know, just from March, late March, just getting the cassette and, you know, how that cassette just carried on through, uh, to me, it really carried on through to, you know, Love, Sexy and the Black Album. You know, I actually got both of those the same day. Um, went to the record store, bought the cassette for Love, Sexy. And then a friend of mine gave me a, the cassette for the Black Album. He had it, made me a cassette. So I got both of those the same day. But yeah, I mean, just grooving on Sign of the Times. I mean, that whole album, that carried through all the way through spring, summer. You know, moved out to California in the fall. It was that. And then... You know, that November, the Sign of the Times movie dropped. And that was one, you know, saw that twice in the theater in California. Came back here, came back to St. Louis for Christmas. And, you know, dragged whoever I could drag to go see it. You know, that whole, you know, within that two, three, four weeks I was home, you know. Went back to California, and then by that time, you know, must have rented it on, you know, VHS about a million times. And, you know, finally bought a copy on VHS. I can't remember when, but, you know, like I said, just riding that Sign of the Times train all the way up until the release of, you know, Love Sexy and getting the Black Album. And, you know, this feels a lot like that you know there's so you know just the the buzz of the original album is you know like i said it's the remaster takes me back because the cassette you know was the sound was great on the cassette but you know by the time i know i got the cd you know, it sort of had that sort of dead sound to it, you know, but that was the only medium I was able to listen to Sign of the Times until now. And so it's great to, you know, go back to 1987 because it the sound, it sounds like 1987 again. And then even better with a lot of the songs with the remaster, the range that you get, you know, and the the vault tracks, you know, I'm still digesting the vault tracks still. Um, and, you know, like I said, most, of, well, not most, but there's a handful of the songs that I've had on crappy bootlegs for years. And it's great just to have those clean copies. Um, like I said, I've already got the original album review and the Vault Tracks review. Those are both on YouTube. So go to my Mari Communications 
channel on YouTube and check those out if you haven't. Uh, if some of you still don't have the album and not sure if you want to get it, just listen to those two reviews. Uh, later I'm going to have a review of the live CD. So, like I said, again, this is, you know, it's a sign of the times year. And probably the most, for us Prince fans, and especially fans of that particular era, you know, this is sort of the feel-good moment is in light of everything that's going on, you know. You know, all over the planet, you know. It's, it's uh, you know, it's a bit of a buffer, you know. It's something to feel good about because it just really hasn't been a lot too you know a lot of us have been impacted in one way or another so it's nice to have something like this drop and like i said we'll be riding this side of the times train for a while till we get news of whatever comes next you know whether it's a parade deluxe um you know it's going to be 2021 you know sony is going to be able to take the the ball and run with it so no telling what they're going to come out with first. You know, is it a box set? Is it going to be reissues of For You, Prince, Dirty Mind, just standalone, just the albums originally? Is it going to, you know, be a around the world in a day box set? Love Sexy box set? What are we getting? You know, so right now we're really enjoying this. And hopefully, yes, they're giving us time to digest this. You know, I'm still digesting 1999 you know every now and then but it's great to have all this material out now to listen to and enjoy and it's clean official copies out you know so this is um in the prince musical singularity this is a very exciting time to be in um you know uh, i mentioned dirty mind earlier you know it's that album's 40th anniversary you know that was my gateway album um you know a year late you know um 1981 i was about 15 uh, i've told this story a million times um how i kind of wasn't a prince fan in the beginning although i did like soft and wet just never knew it was him um but you know hearing dirty mind when i had chance to have a you know cassette left behind by somebody that borrowed the album and dubbed it you know using my component set but he forgot the tape and just like uh let me give this a listen and it clicked i got it you know like oh okay this is great and it just opened up the whole field of research so you know that was like the summer of 81 for me so by the fall you know, controversy was on the radio. So that, you know, that was sort of the one two punch like, wow, you know, this is a great album. What could he possibly do next? And then controversy drops and it's like, whoa, this dude just dropped the Lord's Prayer, like right in the middle of a, a funk new wave. I, I don't know what this is. It's funky and I like it. <laughs> and he stuck the Lord's Prayer right there in the center. That's bold. And, you know, that was, you know, that was it. And from that point on through now, here we are. Yeah, I have to kind of research like everything that Prince worked on during Dirty Mind and kind of see like what could a Dirty Mind Super Deluxe sound like? Uh, I know I did an episode during season one um, about, you know, kind of what you could put in, not necessarily in the way of which songs actually, uh, but things like, you know, you've got the album, you've got whatever vault tracks that are relevant, live material that you can, you know, pad that up with. But I really want to see, like, what was going on during that time and like which songs are in circulation and kind of gauge um, kind of like I did with Love Sexy with the last episode, you know, where it's like, what do you, you know, there wasn't a lot of material because that album was recorded so quick, you know, because it was coming off of, you know, where you had 
Sign of the Times, which was already out. And then there were certain songs that he was working on that were in circulation. Um, but there was the Sign of the Times tour. There was, you know, the Sign of the Times film. So it really wasn't a bulk of stuff that we know of. Now, there might be, you know, three, four albums worth of songs that we just don't know about that were recorded during that period. But if you look at the timeline where the Black Album was slated to be next, he withdrew that. And then within the span of a few weeks recorded love sexy it doesn't leave a lot of material that's there but you know i discussed that last week so i'm wondering like what would a dirty mind sound like so i don't know like i said i'll research what i can and see what tracks are you know that are the fan favorites amongst the bootleg collectors you know you know about how many songs could you get you know, uh, one CD, could you get two CDs of vault material? Who knows? I don't know. Check that out. And that might be a topic for next week. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, but meanwhile, like I said, check out the Sign of the Time Celebration by Polish Solid Productions. Check that out. YouTube link is there in the show notes. Uh, check out the Prince Twitter thread for Sign of the Times. Uh, like I said, I won't be on for a while, so my segment won't come up for a while, but um, definitely check out everybody else's because, again, it's the Purple Avengers. You know, we've got the lineup, you know, the Prince Scholars are all there, so by all means, peep that. And we're going to wrap up this episode uh, just talking off the top of the dome, sort of an open mic <laughs> type episode because the only thing I had was the get so much that the the celebration i had to view that so i didn't have time to really prepare a show this time but yeah checking that out still diving into sign of the times reading this book then ended up reading starting to read my, uh, mark brown's book too so i'm reading two books at once still dealing with the non the essentially non-essential essential gig dealing with that and it's a lot of stuff going on folks so yeah, like I said, today was just the non-spoiler review and just a few things off the top of the dome today. So next week will be a little bit more an Amari Purple Talk episode. And also, too, I have to go work on the live track when, as soon as I'm done with this. So, But until next week, be safe. Let's try to have love for one another. And definitely, let's keep it purple and on the one.